This is a cross section through the outer part of the French Alps line through quite a number of years ago. And it shows a number of key structural elements. It shows a series of thrust structures involving the Mesozoic sedimentary cover, chiefly of Jurassic and Cretaceous age, climbing up from a thrust over on the right hand side that carries uh, crystalline basement rocks. So this cross section is oriented west northwest, east southeast. And the west northwest side over on the left lies towards the foreland of the French Alps. The main part of the Alps would lie to the right hand side, so that's the mountain belt side. So the aim of this short presentation is to explore how this cross section has been constructed. And the section is constructed so that it is a balanced cross section. We'll discuss what this means as we go on. So the image has two key components. It has the balanced cross section at the top and equally important, a restored template at the bottom. The balanced cross section is an interpretation of the present day structure fully drawn in. So it shows how all these strata continue to depth beneath the landscape, but also shows how the geology joins up where it's been eroded, for example, across the top of the subalpine chains. And the restored template is a carefully constructed reconstruction of the pre-thrusting state, where the beds are measured and reported back from the balance section to show their disposition before thrusting occurred. And this attribute of the present day cross section, that it is restorable onto a template to show some meaningful geological arrangement, is what makes that cross section balanced. So the point of the restored template is to show that the section is restorable. In other words, that it balances, but also it's an aid to the construction of the cross section itself. And we can also use the restored template to explore the attributes of the pre-existing geology. So we can reconstruct something of the basin geometry that existed before the Alps were formed. So the key element of this is we're going to build the restored template as the cross section itself is drawn. In doing this, we're going to assume a so-called piggyback thrust sequence. In other words, the deformation migrated from the mountain wood side, that's over on the right, towards the foreland on the left as the structures developed. And when restoring the cross section, we work back in time. So we'll start by restoring the most recent structures which here are interpreted to lie over there on the left in the Jura fold belt. So here's the near surface geology that we can compile onto the cross section on the basis of the outcrop pattern in this part of the Alps. The left hand side of the section, which is part of the Jura fold belt, has this dark green Cretaceous marker coming up pretty much to outcrop in a couple of places, overlain by four deep sediments of largely Miocene age. But as we go into the subalpine chains, which are in the center of this image, we can see we've got Jurassic rocks coming to outcrop and our dark green Cretaceous marker is eroded away largely. Then we cross a structure called the Tone Syncline, and eventually we come to basement rocks over on the eastern side of our profile where basement rocks come to outcrop. This eastern side of the profile was once overlain by far travel thrush sheets which are preserved in the tone syncline as a clipper. So the eastern part of our cross section formed as a buried thrust system. In contrast, the foreland side towards the Jura well, there the thrusts climbed out into the fallen basin and were presumably emergent. A really big constraint on our cross section is the top of basement that underlies the Jura and subalpine chains. And that's been imaged seismically and apparently shows the fallen basement continuing to depth in an unfaulted state. And finally, presumably the basement rocks that outcrop over on the right hand or mountain belt side of the profile represent the 
crests of a basin massif that have been carried up on some thrust that lies in turn in the subsurface. This would be termed the alpine sole thrust uh, on regional studies. Right, well, let's get going. And we won't prejudge where the basement thrust goes for now. We're going to start over there on the foreland side. And to do this, we'll set up a pin line as shown. Well, let's think about this pin line a minute because the cross section as I've drawn it isn't the very edge of the deformation. In other studies, we can infer there's something like 18 kilometers of further slip that lies out to the west northwest. So this pin line we're setting up is only for the cover sediments, that's the Jurassic and Cretaceous strata, that lie above a detachment in the Triassic rocks. So for this pin line, we assume for the cover, there's no interbed slip. So our first task in our interpretation is to draw in the frontal structures underneath the Clergium anticline to build an interpretation. There we go. And what we've done is complete the continuity of the Jurassic underpinnings of the Clergian anticline and the next anticline that lies over there to its right. Our interpretation shows that thrusts involve the full stratigraphy and detach at the top of the basement. And in order to do a restoration, I'm going to set up a loose line further back in our cross section, again, through which we'll assume there's no interbed slip apart from its basal detachment. And now we take that geometry that we've drawn on our cross section and unravel it and report it back onto the restore template. Measuring bed lengths systematically from the pin line across the thrust structures all the way to the loose line. And if our interpretation is geometrically balanced, the loose line on our restored section will be perpendicular to the stratigraphic layering. In other words, each of those stratigraphic layers will have shown the same horizontal contraction. Notice the thrust trajectories that we restore onto the restored template have the same attributes as shown in the real cross section at the top. The thrusts cross the full stratigraphy and detach at the top of the basement. And the key point to drawing our loose line at this stage is to make sure that the geometry we've interpreted um, beneath the clergy on anticline is restorable. If we don't do this analysis at this stage, any uncertainties and irregularities in the structure for the clergy on anticline will propagate through the rest of our interpretation, and we don't really want that. So the material matches between the restored and final state sections, so this frontal part of the structure as interpreted balances. Our loose line is robust, so we can now continue from here to move further east into our interpretation. So far, our stratigraphy is layer cake. In other words, it's constant thickness across all the thrust sheets on the restored section. As we'll see shortly, that attribute does not apply as we go further into the subalpine chains. So we're going to have to be careful what I'm going to do is hang our stratigraphy from a datum, this dark green Cretaceous marker. So we can draw that onto our template across like this. And we're going to hang our stratigraphy from this marker as we go. Well, let's see how we do this. And we're going to start off by continuing to the right of our loose line here. And at this stage, we can see our markers are not too bad. So let's just rehang them in there. Now we need to look at this part of the cross section, because that's going to restore to here, continuing along our dark green Cretaceous marker. So let's just explore how this works. I've put on some markers now that correlate hanging wall and foot wall across a major thrust that emerges in the Annecy area. We can recognize the foot wall termination or cutoff of our dark green Cretaceous marker there, and we can recognize it in the hanging wall on the cross section, and we can put them back together again on the restored template and continue to work along our profile. So let's do that. Let's continue on our dark green marker now in the hanging wall to this thrust that appears at Annecy. And that's where it is on our restored section. Now we're moving a little ahead of ourselves here. 
because we need to check the stratigraphic thickness of the underlying Cretaceous rock so we can see to the left of that yellow marker. And that's quite difficult on this cross section, so we're going to zoom in. Let's see how the Cretaceous rocks are changing thickness. In the structures we've restored so far, the lower Cretaceous underneath that dark green marker is pretty much a consistent thickness all the way. But as we go into the overriding thrust sheet, we can see that the distance down to the thrust from our Cretaceous marker is significant. There's a thick lower Cretaceous succession. And that's not just an artifact of our interpretation on the cross section here in the subsurface. We can also see it plays out in these measured sections at outcrop. So as we've gone into the subalpine chains, the lower Cretaceous has become significantly thicker. So back to our cross section, what we can do now is go to our yellow marker on the cross section at the top, measure the thickness on this cross section of the lower Cretaceous and rehang it here on our template. And now we can rehang the rest of the stratigraphy, not only the Cretaceous thickness that we've got now, but also the underlying Jurassic strata like this. Notice that the Cretaceous rocks have detached from the underlying Jurassic strata. In the upper cross section there, there's not enough space in the cross section to put a full thickness of stratigraphy, essentially between the loose line and our yellow blob. There's only a thin space in there within which we can place our, our still thick Cretaceous rocks, but we can't put the whole Jurassic strata in there. So they're going to remain beneath the thrust sheet. And we're going to worry about where they appear on the cross section shortly. So let's continue on and we'll trace out the extent of our dark green Cretaceous marker. So we're going to continue across the cross section. And we'll extend on the template the green Cretaceous marker so we'll know where to hang our stratigraphy. In the tow and syncline, we're going to set up a new loose line here, hanging from the low point in the syncline. So we can measure around the sinuous length on the cross section of our dark green marker, and then take that measurement and report where that new loose line lies on the cross section. So now we have to complete the rest of the cross section that takes us to that loose line in here. You can see we've taken our stratigraphy of our Jurassic strata and our thick lower Cretaceous and wrapped it around under the syncline. So we can take that interpretation now and plot it on the restored section like this. So we need to work back between the restored section and the final state cross section at the top to make sure that the amount of material we show on our restored section is actually represented on the cross section again to achieve that local balance. So we're making sure our bed lengths work. To be clear, the loose line should be robust. So in other words, it should remain perpendicular to the strata, not only in the final state cross section at the top, but also in the restored template. If our measurements allow this to happen, the loose line is said to be robust. And of course, we're assuming there's no interbed slip and the section's balancing. But we're not finished yet. We can now use the restored template to complete the rest of the cross section because the restored template defines the total extent of the Jurassic strata that we've yet to draw into the cross section. So we can take these strata here, which lie in the foot wall to our thrust that's got the pink blob on it, and draw it onto the cross section so that the cross-sectional areas on the restored template match that that we've taken onto the cross-section itself. Well, now let's consider briefly where the basement rocks carried up in the hanging wall to the basal belladon thrust here um, have come from. In other words, where is the ramp that's, that originates um, that basement thrust sheet? Well, on the restored template, this basement ramp can lie no further to the west than the red blob we've shown here. And that requirement is there because of the extent of the Jurassic that must lie in its foot wall. We can take that information and put it onto the cross section. The basement ramp on the cross section could be no further west than this. In other words, the 
basement structure that represents the external velodon massif can't quickly root into the underlying crust, that thrust must lie further off to the southeast. Well, in fact, it has to lie further away than that. But remember, we mentioned at the start that there's about 18 kilometers of further slip to the west in the Jura. Our pin line that we set up was only robust for the cover strata, so we can't use it on its own to infer the position of the basement ramp because thrust displacement runs back along the base of the cover, back to our red blob on the right. So in other words, our basement ramp must lie maybe as much as another 18 kilometers further east. So we looked at a cross section through this a part of the Jura fold belt and subalpine chains and how we've been able to construct it so that it balances. The key part of this is the restore template. To emphasize, the restore template is necessary to go alongside the cross section so that we can show the cross section itself is restorable and is to show the trajectories of the thrust and how they work through the stratigraphy. We've also seen that the construction of the restore template actually is an important aid in the construction of the cross section itself. In doing this exercise, we rehung our stratigraphy from beneath a datum that was the dark green Cretaceous marker bed. We have to assume that the length of our marker bed has been conserved during the deformation. I can add that the dark green Cretaceous marker in practice actually is a platform carbonate that retains its um, stratigraphic thickness around the folds. So it's a pretty good choice as a key bed for this restoration. The other assumption that's important here is that of the piggyback thrust sequence. Therefore, we've been able to use our restoration of the Jura fold belt to establish the underpinnings of the subalpine chains and use that to constrain our cross section as we've gone. So the assumption of piggyback thrusting is inherent in the way we've done our restoration. So as a reminder, we took our surface geology, we've made an interpretation based on the types of structures we see at the Earth's surface in constructing this cross section, we've assumed piggyback thrusting and we've built our restore template as we went. By restoring the cross section onto a template as we draw it, it allows us to use information from the restoration to help us draw further parts of the cross section. And it also allows us to involve lateral stratigraphic variations in a dynamic interpretation. So an illustration then of how the synchronous construction of restored templates can inform the construction of a balanced cross section in a fold and thrust belt.